Hello and welcome to the Midweek Bible Study for the First Christian Church in uh, Galax, Virginia. This is uh, Interim Pastor Glenn Sage bringing you the study uh, uh, today. And uh, we are finishing up the uh, sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. We've been about four weeks or so uh, studying this particular chapter, so we have uh, five verses that we're going to cover uh, today. That's uh, verses 67 through 71. And then we'll begin with uh, John the seventh chapter, and we'll try to look at the first 13 verses of John 7. So uh, as we uh, look at these uh, verses uh, from the Gospel of John, the uh, last verse that we studied last week was uh, an assessment of what was happening with Jesus' ministry in the province of Galilee. And uh, that was uh, when he had talked to uh, those that were gathered there uh, about the fact that his body was bread indeed and his blood was, was drink indeed, and except a person uh, eat and drink of this uh, symbolic substitution for his real body, the uh, communion, uh, that they would have no part with him. So uh, following this, there was an assessment made about uh, the crowd, and it said, and from that day forward, many went back and walked with him no more. And uh, so as long as they were understanding and as long as they were impressed with all the miracles that he performed, they were right there with him. But then uh, when Jesus said uh, a saying that, was, uh, that they described in this way, they said, this is a hard saying indeed, who can bear it? And then it said that uh, many went back and walked with him no more. So uh, following uh, this uh, abandonment of Jesus, we pick up on these uh, last few verses. Jesus at this time turns his attention to the disciples. And it said, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And then the uh, chief spokesman for the group, who was um, always quick to answer, who was Simon Peter, it said, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So uh, Simon Peter recognizes that there's no substitute for Jesus. There's no, there is no alternate way. Jesus had declared this in, in his teachings. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. And so uh, Simon Peter and the other disciples uh, certainly had bought into that, that he was, he was the only way. And anybody who attempted to come up any other way, the same was a thief and a robber. <coughs> Excuse me. So then, uh, and, um, and then Simon Peter continues on, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So uh, here is a continued profession of faith that, uh, that Peter is willing to make any time that he's called upon to make that, uh, to make that uh, kind of faith statement. And uh, we are also called upon to do that both in word and in deed. Our life needs to reflect the fact that Christ is the Lord of our lives. He is uh, King of kings and Lord of lords. And uh, we need to be willing to confess him and, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, confess our discipleship to Jesus. So uh, after Peter answered in the 70th verse, Jesus answered them and said, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. So here uh, Jesus, for the first time, is indicating that betrayal would come from within. Now, he wasn't explicit about this, and so the disciples were probably unsure what he meant by calling one out as a devil. But, uh, of course, uh, Judas Iscariot was described as uh, he was from his fa uh, father, the devil, from the very beginning. Uh, the thing that seemed to have corrupted uh, uh, Judas was, uh, was money. 
on one occasion, uh, a woman came and uh, broke open a bottle of precious spices and ointment and began to uh, uh, anoint the feet of Jesus. And she used the hair from her head to, as a towel to dry Jesus' feet uh, as she anointed him with these uh, precious uh, spices. And uh, Judas was very quick to pipe up and say, uh, Lord, uh, uh, you need to rebuke this woman because uh, this, uh, these spices could have been taken and sold for uh, a, a large amount of money, and this could have been used to contribute to the needs of the poor. So uh, you need to uh, set her straight and not have her wasting this on you. And Jesus responded by saying that uh, you have the poor with you always, but this woman has done this as a memorial to me. And wherever the gospel is preached, this needs to be told about her as a memorial. So uh, if we're faithful to the gospel, we not only need to be faithful to uh, the teachings and preaching uh, of the truth of Jesus Christ and his word, but we also need to uh, uh, be responsible to lift up the deeds and actions of other people that Jesus says that we need to remember. And so this needs to be a living memorial uh, to uh, this woman who anointed his feet, which uh, generally is thought as being Mary Magdalene. Uh, so uh, then in verse 71, Jesus says, He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he, uh, he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So uh, uh, of Jesus' disciples, about 8% uh, were losers from the beginning. They, uh, Judas was described as being, uh, uh, being basically a disciple of the devil rather than a disciple of Jesus. So uh, this closes out the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, and now we enter into the seventh chapter. And in the first verse, it says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. So Jesus now has passed through a transition. Uh, he, first of all, had this uh, roughly a year of obscurity when people were just beginning to know Jesus. Then the second year was a year of popularity when uh, the crowds thronged him and everybody was excited to see him. And then the Pharisees especially began to use every occasion possible to gather uh, uh, evidence, which was not real evidence, but was always a distortion of what Jesus had to say. Uh, and so uh, this was a time of persecution where the Jews uh, and especially the Jewish leadership was looking for ways to discredit him. And if they couldn't discredit him, then they were going to have to do away with him because he was continually uh, growing in popularity, uh, especially among the common people. So uh, in verse 2, it says, Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacle was at hand. And this was sort of uh, equivalent to our uh, Thanksgiving, uh, a time of um, thanks for their harvest and so forth. And uh, it was uh, one of the high festive occasions. The Jews had about seven of these uh, festive occasions. And uh, so the Feast of the Tabernacle was a very important date. And um, so uh, Jesus... Uh, usually tried to celebrate all the festive occasions that the Jews had, and many times he made his way up to Jerusalem, especially for the Passover, because he wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, he was eventually going to become the Paschal Lamb. He, his action of being uh, crucified uh, was, uh, was meant to... Uh, be the plan of redemption so that we might be redeemed from our sins. Uh, here as uh, the Feast of the Tabernacle was about to be celebrated, his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into uh, Judea, that thy disciples may also see the works that thou doest. 
So he, he had a, a following uh, also in the uh, southern province of, of uh, Judea. And uh, his disciples were encouraging him to go there. But that was the most risky area for Jesus to visit because uh, there was a huge um, congregate of, um, uh, of the Orthodox Jews that uh, were seeking to discredit him and uh, eventually do away with him. And uh, so they were saying, you, you need to go there and show those people the same kind of miracles that you have displayed here in the province of Galilee. In verse 4 it says, For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou doest this, these things, show thyself to the world. So uh, they were encouraging Jesus to, uh, to demonstrate and to show and to teach uh, the, the things that they had come to be excited about. And uh, they're, they're being selected as, as the inner twelve of the, uh, of the disciples. Uh, this, of course, would have enlarged their fame. So we're not sure uh, how much was, uh, was truly uh, wanting to see the gospel quickly spread or uh, how much they were also looking uh, to uh, lift up their own vanity. In verse uh, 5 of the seventh chapter, he says, For neither did his brethren believe in him. Uh, so uh, there were many, many people in, uh, in the southern province of Judea that didn't believe. And so the disciples saw this as an opportunity. And uh, they were uh, pressing for Jesus to act in a hurry. Jesus had a well laid out ministry and everything was to fall in place at certain times. It was ideal for Jesus to be arrested and crucified at the Passover feast, one of the high festive occasions. It was very vital that Jesus be born uh, at the time that he was. Uh, Galatians, the fourth chapter, tells us that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. And this coincided with a political decision. And that political decision was made by Augustus, who then was, uh, was emperor of the Roman Empire. And uh, he decided that all the world should be taxed and there needed to be a census taking so that they could tell uh, who all the people were, where they were, uh, so they wouldn't lose any revenue. And uh, so he made a decree that all the world should go to their hometowns, the place where they were born, and uh, there they were to uh, uh, the place of their parentage, and, and there they were to uh, uh, enter into the census for eventual taxation. So, uh, Mary and Joseph went up to Bethlehem for uh, they were uh, from the tribe of Judah and their uh, ancestors had been from Bethlehem. So uh, they, uh, they went there. So uh, God's timing and the disciples' timing didn't always correspond. The scripture tells us in one place that we are to wait upon the Lord. Uh, patience is an important virtue. Uh, timing is vitally important. Sometimes if we approach uh, people about their spiritual needs and the Holy Spirit has not had time to work with that person, uh, then uh, we can set ourselves up uh, for rejection, not only of ourselves, but also of Jesus' wondrous invitation to uh, find salvation in Him. So we need to be patient and work on God's time schedule uh, rather than our own. So God has everything set up perfectly. Uh, we may think that uh, God is moving slowly. Uh, I think uh, poor old Noah must have thought that as he got out there and began to build on his ship uh, that uh, was about 450 feet uh, uh, long and uh, 45 feet wide. And uh, it took him 120 years and uh, finally, when it was completed, that was the ideal time for the closing of that era of salvation. And as few as seven people, seven souls were saved. 
Now, I have a feeling that Noah probably had some converts along the way. People who said, boy, he's talking about a great flood that's going to engulf the whole world. Uh, we, we need to uh, help out on this boat so we can ensure that our family will have passage. But 10 years passed and 20 years and 30 years and 50 years and nothing happened. So people thought, well, the Lord delays his coming. Just like the parable that Jesus taught about the servants who thought that the Lord had delayed his coming and they began to live in a riotous way. But uh, God will do everything in his own perfect time. And uh, our, requ our requirement is simply to be faithful. Whatever time God chooses, we need to be ready for that time. So uh, they were encouraging him to uh, go up uh, to, uh, to this Feast of the Tabernacle. And uh, in verse 7, it says, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So uh, Jesus called a spade a spade uh, when he saw uh, uh, evil behavior or attitudes. Uh, he called people's attention to it because it was the kind thing to do. If we allow people to continue in their transgressions, that's not being kind. Uh, you may save people's feelings and uh, people may think that, oh boy, you're doing them a favor by not calling their sins into question. But uh, Jesus calls sin into question because first of all, it diminished their uh, lifestyle, their pleasure in living. Uh, sin uh, is described in the Bible as having, there is pleasure in sin for a season, but the, but the end consequences for it is not a good ending. And uh, so uh, uh, Jesus wasn't popular uh, to those who wanted to continue in their sin. And uh, so uh, Jesus goes on to say, Go ye up unto the feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet full come. So Jesus is saying, It's not the time for me to be offered up. It's not the time for me to be lifted up so that I might all draw, draw all men unto me. But um, Jesus was giving them permission to go ahead. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. So this was a continuation of his uh, Galilean ministry. And uh, because there was great risk and it could have brought to a head uh, the, uh, the uh, ultimate end of Jesus' public ministry. But he had other things to do. He had people to heal. He had people to save. Uh, and uh, he was waiting for this great high festive occasion when there was probably at least 25,000 people that would gather at Jerusalem. There were people uh, from every uh, nation and tongue. When the disciples uh, spoke there on another festive occasion, 50 days after the uh, Passover, after the crucifixion, um, they... Uh, uh, the disciples interpreted the, uh, the message in 12 different languages and dialects so uh, all the people could understand. Uh, Jesus had a sign placed over his head. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And so this needed to take place, that there needed to be a public display so all those that were congregated at, at Jerusalem would know this. And of course, the Pharisees rushed up to Pilate and said, no, don't, don't put that sign up that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Put on the sign, for he saith that he is the King of the Jews. And Pilate had it printed in three different languages, both in Greek and in Hebrew, uh, and uh, also in Latin, uh, so that people from, uh, th from the last uh, major world empires could understand what, what was uh, the title for Jesus. And Pilate's response back to them was basically, I'm not going to cater to your wishes. 
He said that uh, what I have written, I have written. It was like it was the law of the Medes and the Persians. There was no, not going to be any changing of it. But it happened in the fullness of time. It happened at the right time. And the disciples was not going to bring about uh, this time of the Lord's uh, death and resurrection. But it was going to happen in God's time. We're not going to bring about the end time. We're not going to bring about Christ's return. That is in the hands of the Father. Not even the angels of heaven know when this is going to take place. So we, our role is to be faithful and to be patient, to wait upon the Lord. For his timing is the right timing. It's the ideal timing. But uh, as we observe all of these calamities surrounding us, uh, we are made aware that, uh, that Jesus' coming could be very, very near. But I'm certainly not a date setter. We've had plenty of those throughout human history. And they've all proven wrong. So, uh, uh, but his disciples uh, went ahead and took that invitation from Jesus. Uh, but his brethren uh, were gone up. Then went he also into the feast, not openly, but as, as it were in secret. So he sent his disciples on ahead and they... They went on, and they weren't even aware that Jesus was coming. But he uh, showed up, but it was not a big spectacle because uh, he didn't want to arouse opposition. He didn't want to bring about a time when there was backlash and the possibility of being arrested. Uh, there was one time when uh, Jesus taught in the temple that the people were angry at his teachings because it was contrary to what they'd always thought was going to unfold. And uh, so uh, they had decided that they would rise up and they would take him uh, out to the uh, edge of the city and they would cast him down this steep embankment. But uh, when uh, they started to capture Jesus, the scripture tells us that he passed out from among their midst. He just sort of vanished. They didn't know where he went, but he wasn't where they could lay hands on him because the time was not right. The time that uh, he was to be revealed in the role of saviorhood was yet to come. So uh, when uh, the, the, uh, he appeared there in, uh, in secret, in the 11th verse, it says, Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? They saw his disciples, and uh, at this point, uh, probably for uh, nearly two years that Jesus' disciples had been everywhere that Jesus was. So um, they uh, saw his disciples. They did not see Jesus, and they were looking for him. In verse 12, it tells us, And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He's a good man. And others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. So, what is Jesus? Jesus, uh, if, if we're a Christian, we have to believe that Jesus is all that he claims to be. Now, some people uh, think, well, Jesus was a great teacher, and therefore we should reverence him. Well, what Jesus taught was, I am the Son of God. I am the, son, I am the Savior of the world. And if he is anything less than this, he would be a liar and therefore undeserving of our allegiance and our worship. But Jesus is all that he claimed to be. He, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he didn't back away from his kingship and his lordship uh, as he was questioned. And so there was controversy concerning who Jesus is. And even in the Christian movement today, there's still controversy about who Jesus is. What is Jesus' uh, uh, commission for us? Uh, should we be a vengeful people? Uh, should we attack those who think differently than ourselves? Uh, should we, uh, uh, should we uh, be self-centered and indulgent? Or 
should we follow his examples? And his examples was one of compassion and love and caring. And um, this shone everywhere he went. He heard the voice of a person whimpering. He felt the touch of the hem of his garment. He was aware of the person who cried out, Tame, Tame, unclean, unclean. And he stopped and he spoke to the lepers and he told them what they needed to do. He spoke to women in public, which was unheard of at that time. So Jesus was all of these things that he, that he claimed to be, and the people were in controversy. Some said, he's a good man, and others said, no, he deceives the people. What we think about Jesus is vital for our mission in life, how we honor him, how we respect him, how we conduct our lives, how we show our allegiance. We either see him as not only a good man, but the son of God, the savior of the world, or we see him as, uh, uh, as a false teacher, as somebody who, uh, who does evil, who speaks evil. So there is no neutral position. There, there was no third position mentioned here. Some thought he was wonderful. Some thought he was bad. And others just didn't know what to think about Jesus. No, there was no neutral ground. And as Jesus talked about discipleship, he talked about the importance of, um, of us following one road or the other. There was the narrow road that led from this life to life everlasting. There was the broad road that led down to destruction. But there wasn't a mediocre road. There wasn't a road that carried us to purgatory or limbo or some intermediate place where the prayers of the righteous saints would eventually uh, bring us forth to where we could move up to a higher level. Uh, Jesus says, it's this or it's that. It's not anything in between. It said here in verse 13, it says, How bet no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. And so uh, uh, there were more whisperings about Jesus. Uh, this wasn't a, a broad proclamation. Now, nearly a year later, things would be different. When he would enter into the, to the city through the eastern gate, the triumphant entry, the same gate that his forefather, David, entered a thousand years before. And his people would cry out, for Saul has been victorious over his thousands. But David has been victorious over his ten thousands. Here, when Jesus entered into the eastern gate, the people would cry out, Hosanna! Hosanna to him that cometh in the name of the Lord. And uh, they praised and they, uh, they admired him. But where were those people on Good Friday? In less than a week, he lost those that were defending him, that were speaking in his favor. They were not to be found. Perhaps because of the same reason here at the Feast of the Tabernacle. He said, how about no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews, for fear of the Jewish leadership. In other words, they were afraid that, uh, that if they spoke in favor of Jesus, that the Pharisees and Sadducees and those who opposed Jesus might find reason to oppose them as well. There were those... Uh, uh, that were fearful that they might get kicked out of the synagogue. And uh, they saw their salvation uh, somewhat in this uh, building. Uh, Herod had reconstructed uh, the temple that Solomon had once built. It was a magnificent building, and uh, they had the, uh, the right to excommunicate people, to kick them out of the temple. But uh, the important thing is not what building you might be excommunicated from, but the fact that your name is written above, that your name is written on the Lamb's book of life. And so Jesus came into the world to seek and save those that are lost. 
and he plotted about his earthly journey in a way that was to the clock. It was to the calendar. It was according to what God wanted to happen. God also wants our lives to uh, follow method and timing. God wants us to, uh, f- uh, to remember our Creator in the days of our youth, when the evil days draw not nigh, when we would say that we have no pleasure in them. So God wants us here and now to commit ourselves to Jesus Christ. Don't waste another week. Don't waste another day not following Christ because he has a plan for you. He has work for you to do, and he is calling you to that work. Let us uh, bow together in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you that Jesus traveled about the country, reaching out to various people from different walks of life, from those that were rulers in the temples and the synagogues, to those that were lowly farmers and fishermen, to those that uh, that had suffered many things over their lifetime and had exhausted every means possible to find a cure and there was no cure available for them. But Jesus was the answer. When they reached out and touched the hem of his garment, when they cried out to him, Master, save us lest we perish. We know that Jesus answered those calls and those petitions. We know that Jesus is still in the saving business. He's looking for those to turn from their ways of, of, uh, of infidelity to him and not being faithful in their service. And he is calling them to focus their attention upon him, to look upon him and to call upon him in order that they might receive salvation. So Lord, uh, uh, continue to speak to those that are in need of a Savior. Speak encouragement to those that are downtrodden, that are beaten down and feel that there's no answer for their lives because you are the answer. You are forever with us when we may feel abandoned by all those that surround us. You're ever present. You promise that, lo, you are with us always, even till the end of the world. We thank you for your ever presence, your love, and your concern. Bless us, Lord, in our lives and bring us back at the next appointed time, both to church and to the study. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.